Bob, in looking at the, um, the field of biology and looking for areas that uh, have, have been new ways of thinking, the whole idea of, of kinship as a way of understanding evolution in the biological world is a very powerful one, and you are certainly one of, if not the pioneer, in, 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 in taking that idea and really explicating it in, in ways that nobody ever thought before. So tell me about that. What are examples of, of, of uh, new ways of thinking that relate to kinship? Okay, well, the, the, the first uh, paper I did uh, just three years after reciprocal altruism was uh, on parent-offspring conflict, and that was trivial in its logic. That is, that followed directly from Hamilton's uh, kinship theory. It's just I applied it to parent and offspring, and um, the key there was if, if, if uh, let's say, a mother looks at her five offspring, she's related to each of them by a half, assuming she's not inbreeding with one of the fathers. Mm -hmm. uh, so no matter who the father is, she's related to each of them by a half. However, each offspring is related to itself by one and to its sibling by a half if they have the same father mm -hmm. and a quarter if they have a different one. So right. we'll skip that one. We'll just say they've got the same father. Mm -hmm. So we've got a nuclear family, but you've got uh, uh, parent off spring conflict there because the mother is not selected to give you her offspring as much as you want because she has to partition it among four others in such a way as to maximize the total number. Whereas you want to maximize uh, your own uh, plus the siblings devalued by a half right. compared to yourself. Right. So things like weaning conflict immediately were explained by it. That is, at the end of the period of parental investment, mom wants to stop. Uh, offspring does not. It wants to keep sucking. Mm -hmm. So there's conflict, and that's written all over mammals. And you see it, and you see it in, in humans as well, crying uh, to get the uh, uh, breast and so on. Uh, but, uh, so first I realized, uh, in fledging conflict, you have the same thing in birds. Uh, fledging is when the bird reaches adult size because in birds you don't change in size once you start flying. So you reach adult size while you're still being cared for by your parents. And once again, there's uh, uh, offspring begging the parents and the parents start avoiding them. Mm. Uh, they'll, they'll perch somewhere different than their offspring at night. I've watched this with pigeons because mm. they don't want to be harassed all night long. <laughs> so uh, th that's fledging conflict. But then I realized, well, there's conflict uh, before the end of the period of parental investment. It's still, you can just draw these cost-benefit curves and, uh, and the mother is, uh, is uh, here's the benefit and here's the cost and uh, the difference between the two. But the offspring uh, divides the cost by a half because <laughs> that's its siblings. Hmm. And so the two are different. So that was parent-offspring conflict. Now, uh, there was one day uh, way back uh, in 72 after I got a postdoc and I was with Herb DeVore uh, going around to Kenya and Tanzania and India looking at monkeys. So we're at the Gombe Stream Preserve uh, where Jane Goodall was uh, studying um, uh, chimpanzees. And um, I'm walking along the beach with Robert Hind, a, a well-known British uh, animal behaviors, and it suddenly came to me, by God, there's conflict over our conscience, because our conscience is something that mediates our moral behavior yeah. towards relatives as well as non-relatives, and it's being formed, we believe, you know, at, at quite a young age, two, three, four, is when your conscience mm -hmm. is being put together. But... Um, you can be dead and gone, and if you molded the conscience, you the parent, to reflect your own computation more than the oh. offspring's computation, mm. you benefit, 
Now, you're not around to see the benefit, but natural selection don't care about that. <laughs> so when I realized that that's how deep uh, parent-offspring conflict uh -huh. went, uh -huh. right into our, I almost said soul, but, you know, right into our deepest psychological uh -huh. corner. Uh -huh. uh, I'll give you one other example, and then I want to come to some uh, recent work uh -huh. taking it in a quite different direction. Um, there's a uh, guy that has my old job at Harvard named David Haig, who's uh, just a brilliant evolutionary geneticist, Australian. And he was the first to realize, he actually realized it in plants, but then uh, mammals very quickly, that uh, there's such a thing as genomic imprinting in which there are maternally active genes in you and the paternal copy is silenced. Mm. And there's paternally active genes in you, and the maternal copy is silenced. And that's because uh, a maternal gene does not care about dad and his relatives, mm. but the maternal one cares about mom and her relatives. Mm. The only overlap is full siblings, and there they care about both. Um, so you can literally have a maternal self inside you and a paternal self. And just a joke on David Haig to show you how stone crazy he is. I'm talking to him one evening and he knew my, my dad's name was Howard and my mother's name was Mildred and he says, yes, Mildred. <laughs> and so he's, he's saying that's my maternal yeah, self right, talking. Right. All right, fine. So it's, it's gone deeper than conscience, you know, mm -hmm. and we'll leave, leave aside that. Now, the last two and a little bit more years, and David has been helping me on this, I've been working on a different aspect of kinship in the family, which is a, a, a very depressing and gruesome topic. Uh, but as I like to joke with this woman who's helping me write a, a book on it, hopefully a short book on it, honor killings. Oh. Honor killings are these dreadful crimes in which you slit the throat of your own grown daughter. She's 17, so she's right at the age where she's ready to reproduce. That's high reproductive value. She's also cost you 17 years of your life, and maybe you even have some feelings for her. Why are you slitting her throat? Because you found lipstick in her purse? Because you found uh, numbers on her cell phone that you don't recognize? These are some of the examples, and uh, they're dreadful examples. Um, so, what's the logic? Well, uh, the, it's, it's found in two cultures, uh, Muslim and Hindu. The Hindu is very different, and we'll hold that on the side. The Muslim culture, it's being driven by frequent first cousin marriages. So p most people don't know it. Hell, I didn't know it till I got to this. 65% of marriages in Saudi Arabia are between first cousins. 45% in Iraq, 40% in Pakistan. And these are all Muslim communities. And furthermore, it's a particular kind of first cousin, namely its father's brother. Mm -hmm. Whereas the general first cousin rule is, is cross cousin, father's sister, or mother's brother, but this is father's brother. Mm -hmm. So it also links together two patrilines, mm -hmm. which means it's even more forceful against women. So what's the argument here? If you have repeated first cousin marriages, it starts jacking degrees of relatedness up. With one first cousin marriage, you're related uh, to, the, to the child by five eighths instead of one half. So it starts climbing. Now, if you've had a whole history of first cousin marriages preceding yours, you may be related to your daughter by, let's say, uh, even 98%, let's say. It drives it up. But it drives your degree of relatedness up to your nephews and nieces by almost the same amount. So you've got a series of, of family members that are to whom you're very closely related. And now it's under outbreeding, you're related to your daughter by a half, nephew or niece by Water. a quarter, right. cousin by an eighth. Everything's dropping by a half, but not 
when you've had frequent first cousin marriages, it's dropping by a much smaller amount, which means that if your daughter does something that brings dishonor, how are we to find that, on the family, the larger family, you value that negative effect much more strongly uh, due to relatedness itself because you're related closely to those that are, quote, being harmed by it. Whereas under an outbred system, no. So the outbred system, you, you, you might, the, the other people who might be so-called harmed by this dishonor might be a, a quarter or an eighth or even more or Absol even less. Absolutely. And under the, the, this system, it's almost as much as your daughter. Exactly. And, uh, and that, exactly. that's very powerful. Yes. Very powerful. Yes. Now, the Hindu one is slightly different because Hindus are organized in castes, as you know, Brahman, mm -hmm. all the way down to untouchable. And especially in rural villages, the castes are very distinct. Now, we know from genetic evidence now that castes are endogamous, uh, uh, have been endogamous for 3,000 years at least. That means Brahmins marry Brahmins, yeah, yeah. Untouchables marry untouchables. You are not allowed to marry someone in a different caste. Most particularly, if, if you marry up, the other, uh, the, the next caste is, they're dead against you, but they're also dead against their daughter because she has, has cast uh, dishonor on them within the caste. And so they have, some, they have some gruesome things in Hindus, like if you're raped, uh, your reproductive value drops to zero because you're no longer a virgin. Now, then they typically then blame her for being raped. Whether she was, you know, careless or not is, is unknown. And they will, believe it or not, have set it up so her brother's raper. So she goes from hut to hut and is raped multiple times and then she's killed. Dreadful. 